Good evening, everyone. I think, uh, well, almost everyone found a seat. Good evening and welcome in the Rode Hood this evening, uh, which for me already started in a special way just, uh, because just minutes ago I got this gift from an artist called Denise Roseboom. Ah, some know her. Inside is a pussy pendant, a vulva, handmade, and inside the box it says, wear it, don't eat it. <laughs> don't know if I, d I agree on that one. Um, my name is Meerte Hilkens, and I will be um, guiding us through the next 90 minutes. Um, when we make programs in this house, it's often a question how to sell it. But this evening, as we see, when a lot of people showed up, um, they say sex sells, and then our guest from this evening is really good at making the one-liners for you. So we had three to pick from. One was unleashing the female O. The other one was masturbation is the new meditation. But we chose Viva la Vulva. Yeah, we're celebrating the vulva tonight, I guess. And I really want to emphasize that tonight is as much about you as it is about our special guest and me. So there are two microphones, and we really invite you to ask any question you have for our speaker tonight, because we think you'll have some. Is there any, are there any people here tonight who are a member of Kili Olivia's Self-Pleasure School? I see a couple. <laughs> Well, that's the good thing about having her here. And other people who want her advice or answers, they subscribe to her website, you become a member, and that's where your coaching program starts. And I think tonight, we are all getting some coaching. I'm curious, I'm, I just turned 40, so I was thinking about this evening, discuss it, discussing it with female colleagues, and we are somewhat in doubt, because you, maybe you hope to become smarter, so maybe I'll learn something that will be of benefit. But that's also a bit of a sad realization because then I had to turn 40 before discovering my own possibilities. So I'm still in doubt. We'll see where this evening takes us. And I think that's what the evening is all about because as our guest says it herself, her um, lectures and presentations aren't about the destination slash orgasm as much as they are about the journey. So, me, myself, I'm also very curious what it is she will be telling us. She came from Scotland, that's where she lives, but she's from the UK originally. Um, a former scientist, author of Unleashing the Female O, and as I said, she also has the Self-Pleasure School, it's an online school with its own YouTube channel, she will be telling us everything about that, but first we will be listening to her for about 30 minutes and then we start the discussion. Please, a warm welcome for Kili Olivia. <laughs> Hello and thank you so much for being here and for celebrating the vulva with me. And actually, tonight, we're going to be celebrating the vulva indirectly. I'm going to take you on a journey of female sexual awakening and the pain of the female psyche, and actually how female sexuality is a portal to reclamation of the body and reclamation of the joyful spirit of woman, of human. So I want to start back in 1995. And I want you to come with me there. And we're in a terraced house in the north of England. And this is the house where my mum lives. And I don't live with my mum all of the time. I live with my dad and I go and visit my mum in the school holidays. And they live about three hours apart. And so it's 95, and I am seven years old, and my mum is 27. And we're in this living room, and so in this room, there's a table and chairs pushed up against the wall, and over to the right is a CD player, 
with speakers. And we spend a lot of time in this room dancing and listening to music. And this was the year that Pulp's Disco 2000 was released. And so the millennia seems so far away from this moment. And I want to tell you about the woman that is my mother. And she is taller than me and more slender. And I realized when I was telling myself this story and practicing it to tell to you that she had this big blonde hair with a bit of a quiff. And then I looked in the mirror and saw the resemblance. And in this particular memory, she has on this zebra print dress. And it's a halter neck dress. And it is this very striking dress. It's kind of this satin material. And she also has on with it red thigh-high boots. Now, I don't remember those. I asked her what she would be wearing, and she told me she would be wearing red thigh-high boots. And she also had this big suede sheepskin jacket on. And so this was my image of woman at seven years old. It was a very powerful image. She had a very powerful energy. Now, a few other memories from that house. One is being in the bathroom and sitting on the toilet with my mother in the bath, obviously naked, and me being so enamored with this naked female body at seven years old. It was such a striking image to me. She had a full bush and voluptuous breasts, and I could not wait to grow up and be a woman. It seemed so exciting that one day I was going to have this female body. So at 27, my mum never ever wore knickers, um, which is underpants, and she would just kind of like put on her jeans and she would be hurdling through life, this force to be reckoned with. And there would be period-stained trousers on the floor, and it just was what it was. There was never any shame around anything like that. So, now you have my memories of seven, being seven. We're going to change track, and I want to talk to you now about some language. I want to talk about a word, virility. So the word virility in the English language, what it means. Does anyone know what the word virility means? Anyone willing to offer? Like manlyhood. manlyhood, yeah. So virility is a word which means to have a strong, powerful life force energy, to have a strong sex drive. It's associated with heroism and valor and power and victory, and it only exists in the male of the language. So you wouldn't use a virility to describe a woman. It's only a word for men. So this is a word which is very interesting to me because what I essentially want to teach women is how to have virility. And the reason I told you that story about my mum is because that is what she embodied to me at that time. She had a strong expression of who she was. She was confident and vivacious. So when I started investigating what is the corresponding word for virility, some sources want to say it's fertility. But that isn't quite correct, because fertility is the capacity to procreate, to produce human life. And it exists for man and woman. Fertility is something that is amongst everyone. So I researched a little bit more, and I found out there's a word called nubility, which isn't very much used anymore. But what the word nubility means is how marriageable somebody is. And this is a word which only exists within the feminine. So these two words are kind of the two words that exist alongside each other. And nubility is how ready for marriage a woman is, how marriageable she is. And the corresponding word for the masculine is how much energy and life force and sex drive he has. So I think this is a really interesting point because it gives us a context for why people are so ready to have this conversation. 
Now, the word which I have thought perhaps is more akin to virility in the English language is the word slut. But obviously, the word slut is a derogatory term, and it's not something that is celebrated. But it is a word which can be used to describe a woman who has a strong, autonomous sexuality. <laughs> so, we have the zebra print dress, we have the context of language. And what I think is really important to consider about those two words is the nubility is it's an external observation. It's somebody else determining whether a woman is ready to be married to somebody else. And the virility is this internal embodied experience of power. Now, we're going to go back and I'm going to tell you another story about my mum. But this time, we are 22 years in the future from 95, not from now. And it's two years ago. It's 2017. And I'm 29, and she's 49. And this time, I'm going to meet her in London. So I'm living in London, and she's come down for the day. And I'm on the tube, and I'm going to meet her at the Museum of London. Now, my relationship with her over these 22 years has been strained and pained and a lot of the things that many of us have in relationships with our parents. And so I'm always a little bit mm, when I'm going to meet my mum because I'm not sure how it's going to go and am I going to like go home and cry. But I've got Bobby with me who's my partner and I know that it's going to be okay. <laughs> and I've, you know, I've done a lot of work to make this be okay. So when I arrive to meet my mum this day, I get off the tube and we're near St. Paul's Cathedral. And the woman which stands in front of me is so different to that woman in the zebra print dress. And she seems so much smaller than me, even though she's taller. And the quiff is gone. And she's just got her hair in this simple plait, which is perfectly fine, but it means something very important when we consider who she is as a person. And there's still a little bit of makeup, but the lipstick's gone, and she's dressed all in black, as I've already said, but that's very important. And her body is so frail and tiny. And in some elements, she looks like she is 99. Not because she's aged not very well, but because she is anorexic. And she has been abusing her body in this way for most of my teenage and adult life. And I wonder how this woman became this woman. And what happened in that journey? It was like this power that she had somehow was turned inwards on herself and became this ferocious, destructive force. Now, I think this is... Why is this related to female sexuality? And what I want to tell you about now is something which you may have heard of before. It's something called the heroine's journey. And it's a model of a woman's journey through life that was developed by Maureen Murdoch, who was a psychoanalyst. And she said that what happens on the female journey through life is that a woman is born into a culture that cannot see who she is. And now this is using very gender-specific terms. And I actually think that this model stands for everyone, anyone who was born into a culture and a culture that cannot fully support who they are. Something happens within them where they become severed from their selves. And so in this model of the heroine's journey, the feminine psyche becomes severed from the feminine. Now this is a really interesting model for me because in my own life, that severance was very real. As in, I literally didn't live with my mother. And so it became really obvious to me, this model. And I, for other people, it happens in much more subtle ways. 
So after the severance from the innate nature of the feminine happens, or the innate nature of the soul, the individual goes and pursues success in the external world and becomes obsessed with seeking validation from outside. And this can look like striving in a career that one doesn't really care for or having patterns within relationships that don't really feed the internal world. What happens after this is at some point, the individual realizes that no matter what they are doing in the external world, inside they feel spiritually dead. It's like this desert of aridity. There's no ability to tend to or flower one's internal garden. And so what happens at this point is a woman has a deep yearning to reconnect with herself to reconnect with her internal world. And this is the point in the journey which is called the call of the goddess. And this is often the kind of thing which happens which brings people into rooms like this. They feel some sort of call, some sort of yearning for self-reclamation. And it is like this internal search and it stops being external. Now this is a very terrifying process to take. And most people will stay in the darkness, in that spiritual aridity, and continue to loop, being too afraid to go inwards. We see it in excessive alcohol use to manage emotions. We see it in things like mental health statistics. There's a lot of being stuck in the darkness. And ultimately, we have to be able to move through the darkness and fully surrender to it. And this is like the state of orgasm. It's, we have to let go of control to fully surrender and to allow new life to form. And so once a woman moves through, she starts to reconnect with herself. And this is the part of the journey which is really interesting to me because this is where sexual reclamation begins. We have to heal the relationship to the body. And a core part of healing that relationship with the feminine is healing the relationship with the body. <laughs> because so much of the disconnection is from within our own bodies. We're afraid of being in our bodies. We have so much shame and judgment around our bodies. People are terrified of a naked body, of their own naked body. And, and from one perspective, it is such a bizarre notion because imagine seeing any other creature and not being so enamored by its innate beauty and magic. You know, you wouldn't judge an old lion for, you know, being a bit old. It would just have so much majesty. And we have such a distorted view of the human body. And so sexual reclamation begins here. For a woman to get to this point, she has to feel a yearning to go within. And often it is the orgasm, it's the excitement which drags us, it's the boon of success. And really it's the journey which we have to go through which is so transformational. So once a woman is able to awaken her sexuality, to restore her soul life, she then experiences a reconciliation and can start to move in the world in a more integrated way, in a more creative way, in a way that feels more in tune with who she really is. And this is such a challenging thing to do in a world that has so many judgments and ideas about who we should be. But ultimately, the promise of sexual reclamation and sexual awakening is full self-expression. It is allowing us to be fully who we are. And to me, this is the most important thing that we can pursue in our lives. I was listening recently to Oscar Wilde audio 
the soul of man under socialism. And in that, he says that really self-actualization happens through the full realization of the personality. And we live in a culture that says we should constantly renounce ourselves, but actually fully being who we are in the world is I think what most people are seeking and what brings us ultimate joy. And this is what virility gives us. It gives us the power to be who we are. So, now we're on to act three. <laughs> and I just will also say about this, the heroine's journey, it is a symbol of the life, death, rebirth nature of women. It's what we see in the menstrual cycle. It's what we see in the season. Sexuality is the way which we can rebirth ourselves into the world. It gives us the energy from within. So to bring the story with my mom to conclusion, I want to take you to just last month. It was January this year, and Bobby and I had gone to Yorkshire, and we'd gone out for a meal. And I'm sat opposite her. In fact, there's a point you need to know before this. So a year after I'd seen her in London, she rings me one day, and she said, Keely, I've seen your Instagram, and I'm a little bit shocked, but have you always been this confident? That was the first question she asked me. And I thought, you've known me for 30 years, 29 years, whatever it was. You know that I haven't. And then she said, she was shocked, but she wanted to know, could she join the pussy revolution? <laughs> <laughs> and then the third question she said was, or oh, am I too old? And I said, of course you could join the pussy revolution, come on in. And then it was maybe about seven, eight months after that, which was this January where I saw her. And bear in mind the time I'd seen her before, and so we went for this meal, and she was still very frail and skinny and wearing mostly black, but the quiff was back, and she had on this bright pink top. And I hadn't seen her wear color like that in at least over 10 years. Now, she decided to join the Pussy Revolution. <laughs> I don't know if she ever actually like, started to self-pleasure or if she was vicariously living through me as in the pussy revolution. But this became so symbolic of what can happen in a woman's internal world when she allows herself to start to experience a deeper nature of herself or to even start to experience it through somebody else. There is a goddess myth, and it's a, it's a, you see it in two different, um, you see it in Japanese and you see it in Greek mythology. It's the same story. And so in the Japanese version of the story, Amaretta Su, who is the sun goddess, she has an argument with her brother and she goes into a deep depression. She goes and hides in the cave. And she is the sun. And so... When she's in the cave, all the crops start dying because the sun is retreated and nothing will bring her out. Everyone, all the, all the gods and goddesses are trying to entice her to come out, but nothing will. And then Azume, who is the goddess of laughter and mirth and humor, starts to dance outside of the cave. And she's doing a striptease and she's doing a sexy dance, and when she flashes her vulva <laughs> at Amrita Sue, she bursts into laughter and she comes back out of the cave. <laughs> and life is restored. Um, <laughs> and you see this in Greek mythology as well. It, Demeter, Persephone goes to the underworld, Demeter's depressed, and there's a goddess, Baubo, who flashes her vulva, and when Demeter sees that, she bursts into laughter and hope and life is restored. And she is also a goddess of life and fertility. So this is kind of, the reason I told you that story about my mom is because it symbolizes actually what happens. 
And obviously the flashing of the vulva can be a real thing, or it can be symbolic of the sexual awakening, the reclamation of the joyful body. So, that is the pussy revolution. That is the promise of sexual reclamation of female sexuality. And it is also within that story of the goddesses, it can happen with other people, but it's also every part of that is within ourselves. When we go into that depression, into that retreat, we have the capacity within ourselves to bring ourselves out. And sexual pleasure, sexual joy, eroticism is really key in doing that, as well as a joyful laughter with it. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Happy faces. Um, are there any questions yet? I want to keep my promise that it's about you more than it's about me. So if there's any question now, then I'll start the conversation. So I was reading about you when I heard you were coming here. Yeah. And what really made me curious was what started your journey? Because you were getting three master degrees at university and then, I don't know, all of a sudden you start masturbating one hour a day? Like, what motivated you to start researching this? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's a practical beginning. <laughs> well, I, I guess very much in the journey of my mom, um, she'd kind of strived to become a teacher and became a head teacher very young and experienced this external success. And I had the same drive. And I thought that the way that you have to go about success is through academia and being clever and doing well at school because that's what's so indoctrinated into us. And so I found myself at 25 working in a university and realized that I didn't really think I was meant to be there. I would go to work kind of dressed in blue velvet leggings and feather earrings, and I was a medical statistician, and I realized that, oh, there's something here which feels very soulless to me. I started to feel that spiritual aridity, and it was so painful. I remember opening my wardrobe and it, like seeing these like blue and brown clothes and thinking, this can't be my life. Like I'd, <laughs> I've seen that in my own mother. And so I started to follow the call within me. And But then what inspired that core to make it a sexual journey? Because you could, I don't know, do mindfulness or so uh, Bhagwan in India. Or, yeah. I mean, there's many ways of starting to search the soul. And yeah. at one point you thought, I'm going to connect with my vulva completely and one hour a day is for me and my vulva. So something must have inspired you to make it so specific. Yeah, so I started to f do different things and eventually felt a calling of what I wanted to do in my career and felt very called to do transformational work. And, and so I started working with women around the menstrual cycle because this was something that I thought was very misunderstood and very misrepresented in the world. And a lot of suffering and misperception. So I started to do that and people's response, they wanted to know more about sexuality. And there's only so much you can go into talking about the menstrual cycle and the womb without having to talk about the pussy and the vulva and sex. So then it was almost like I was feeling pushed and so I then took a training in sexuality and to train professionally to work with people in sexuality and it was part of that training where I did the self-pleasure 
practice. It was like this really intense self-pleasuring practice. So it was a professional training. Oh, uh, was okay. Yeah. So then the journey starts, and then I just, I'm sorry, I'm not doing this because I think it's a, a slapstick. It's really out of interest because, you know, being a 40-year-old, I don't know, maybe searching for validation outside, mm -hmm. like making a career, having children, mm. nothing in my internal world ever thought of planning one hour a day for masturbation. Like, how do I get there even? I'm happy with 10 minutes. <laughs> Yeah, and that's also about, then it is about um, yeah. the destination and not the journey. Yeah, It's practical. But something inside you says, I'm really going to uh, make time every day to do this. What were you looking for also inside? Like, what was it you felt you hadn't discovered yet? Um... Well, there was the intense yearning to live fully as me. And, and working in academia wasn't that. So that was very painful to, to feel like I was live, work, living in a career that wasn't me. And so I had a strong drive to, to really live the soulful life. I was so determined not to repeat what I had seen every, like, so often around me within my own mum's life, and, but also a lot of female friends. And I definitely felt that my sexuality was not fully expressed. My experience, when I first learned to orgasm, I thought it was amazing. And then I thought I'd join like this secret club and it was the best thing ever. And then, and then a few years later, I started to feel that yeah, there was more, that I hadn't even really scratched the surface. So, does that answer your question? I, I'll, I'll go with that. <laughs> I think my, my uh, curiosity is bigger. Yeah. But then, no, you, let's make it uh, less about you and more about the metaphors you chose tonight. Okay. So then, if you tell us about uh, both the Japanese and the Greek myth, yeah. what surprises me is that it's... Um, actually centralizing female uh, sexuality, the vulva, mm -hmm. as a symbol of life itself, the sun starts to shine again, crops mm -hmm. can start growing. So in that period, apparently the sun, the vulva, uh, that uh, uh, wakes by the, gets, how do you say that in proper English? Like, it wakes up when it sees the vulva. Yeah. It wants to come out, it leaves yeah. the depression and enters life again. So at that moment in time, female sexuality, or even the vulva, more explicitly, yeah. has a very strong symbolic power. Then we get to your mom, mm -hmm. whom, yeah, who she's asking you the question, can I join the pussy revolution or am I too old? So I know it's a big question to ask you what happened in between all mm -hmm. these ages, mm -hmm. so you don't need to be too specific. But something appears to, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. it, it's as if we got lost of track. So what's your analysis of what went wrong in these, in, in the metaphors you're using yourself? Yeah. Well, I think it's a big question. And I think, <laughs> yeah. um, I think it's a question that a lot of, it feels to me like there's something missing. Like, what did go wrong and how, how do we know? But certainly something changed where there are many things in history, but it becomes like the human becomes like a machine. So that's for you, both male and female. Yeah, yeah. So that's not th something you project on women only. You feel the same kind of disconnect within male existence. Yes. And I think that, um, I think that sometimes the distortion happens in a different way, or the suffering or the severance happens in a different way for men and for women. But I do think that if someone is an oppressor or an oppressed, there's still a distortion from the true essence of who they are. You were addressing the pain of the female psyche, yeah. more specific, yeah. 
So what is that pain? Why is it specifically female? Because now you're saying this emptiness or disconnection, I project on both male and female life. Mm -hmm. Yet in your talk, you say it's the suffering of the female psyche. Yeah. So why do you emphasize that? Yeah. Because my experience of seeing women, of being a woman, of seeing adult women in my life growing up, there is something very core and unique which seems to distort them and separate them from who they are. But try and define that something So there's something around trauma, around a fear of being in the female body, of the projection of what the female body is, of its um, misuse, of its distortion. And that's in a, for example, commercialized context? In the commercialized context, in context of uh, sexual abuse towards women, it really there definitely is a kind of culture which wants to vilify the female body or make it have to conform to something in a certain way. And I think that a lot of women have a wound around that because there is a statistic in the UK which is that one in eight, 13 percent of 16 to 25 year old women have post-traumatic stress disorder. So that means that one in eight young women are walking around literally in a state of terror constantly. And post-traumatic stress disorder is something that's usually spoken about with people who've been to war. You know, it's like there's like this seems to be this state of war within the female body and within the female psyche. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, still, for me, well, then let's, let's go to, is it fertility? Yeah. I want to say it right. So, the male word, was it fertility? Virility. Virility, thank yeah. you. Um, why are women letting this happen? Because you're about empowerment, mm -hmm. if I understand you correctly. Mm -hmm. So, what's your analysis of the fact that this is happening on this scale for such a long time now? Yeah. So, honestly, I don't know. I don't know why it's happened. I just know that it has happened. And if we look contextually and historically, we can see that it's happened. And what I'm interested in is how do we change that now? Instead of necessarily understanding why it happened, how do we create a sense of empowerment within ourselves and move forward from that place? Make it practical. So, I am a member in this case. Yeah. Tell us about the women who are your... How do you call them clients or mm -hmm. clients? Mm -hmm. What are the questions uh, they come to you with? Mm -hmm. Like, what's the problems you're trying to solve? Mm -hmm. Just because I'm trying to give it, I'm trying to get it from theory to practice. Like, what does okay. it mean for me okay. what you're telling me, or for all the women here tonight, or maybe even men? I don't know how many, how many men are there. Can you raise your hands? There's some, yeah. So, they email you, is that the first step? When they come to your self-pleasure school? Mm -hmm. All very impressed by the men. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> a lot of commotion. So, they email you. And what are the questions, what are the dilemmas, and what makes them think self-pleasure is the solution? Well, a lot of people email me and wanting to know about orgasms and how they, how they can experience orgasm or if they're having sex with their partner and they can't surrender or it's all about the partner's pleasure or they can't experience orgasm. So usually it starts to come from places like that or in relationship, um, in their relationship. And a lot of my clients will be heterosexual women, so 
really struggling in relationship with boundaries or how to navigate their emotions, how to feel a sense of that they can hold themselves in their, through their lives. So usually it starts with them feeling something challenging within their relationship or within their sex life. So and these are grown up women who haven't ever experienced orgasm? That happens? Um, yeah, that could happen, but not necessarily. Um, it can be grown up women who want to be able to experience G-spot orgasm or who want to be able to experience um, a cervical orgasm or a deep vaginal orgasm or orgasm through penetration. So G-spot isn't fiction. <laughs> <sighs> Well, I've got one. So. <laughs> <laughs> no, but just, just yesterday there was this uh, Dutch book presented. And maybe you've seen it. It's uh, about the vulva as well from uh, like a lot of point of views, different essays. It addresses menopause. It addresses menstruation, but also sexuality. And we have this talk show called Yinek. And mm -hmm. yesterday it was uh, discussed at that table. And then I was on Twitter and I saw this tweet and it said... A vaginal orgasm is always a male orgasm. And I was wondering <laughs> what your response to that is. Well, I don't quite understand what it means. Like it's men coming inside vaginas. It's ah, not okay. vaginas coming because there's men inside them. Oh. I think that's my interpretation. Okay. Well, my vagina is definitely orgasmed without a penis inside of it through self-pleasure. So okay, so you're saying... There so that is would be a thing response. as a female vaginal orgasm, and it's not fiction. Yeah. yeah. But then I have these very profiled women who are now 2019 saying this. So even women disagree about this, apparently. What's yeah. going on? I don't know. <laughs> yeah, she meant it's clitoral. Yeah, but it's not inside the vagina that a woman can orgasm. I think that was also... Yeah. A clitoral orgasm inside, yeah, because the clitoris is inside the vagina. I'm translating, yeah, you hear what yeah. you're saying? So that, that's the clitoris, right, on that ring, do you see that? So the clitoris is the little head that sticks out, but then it also has these two, like, legs which kind of engulf back into the vagina. And some people say the G-spot doesn't exist and that an internal vaginal orgasm is just this part of the clitoris being stimulated. And there are other people who say, well, no, that's not my experience. And there are experiences of women who are quadriplegic, who can have orgasms from their cervix. So there's different nerves which innervate different parts of the pelvis. Um, and certainly my experience of, of having a G-spot orgasm, finding the G-spot, it is a different experience than when I just have a clitoral orgasm. Like, they are definitely two different experiences. But you, you named three, right? So if clitoral... G-spot, cervix. Sorry? The cervix. The cervix, okay. So the cervix is like deep in the vagina and the cervix is what opens when the baby comes through the womb. Okay. And on your website, at one point you describe, I don't know, I think it was a cervix orgasm, but yeah. now I'm guessing. But then you say, I think it was in one of your videos, like, you know, I had to cry and I felt like this marshmallow floating through space and I was watching and I was like, whoa, what the hell am I missing? Like, <laughs> I enjoy orgasm, but I never uh, described it as floating through space like a marshmallow. Mm -hmm. So, what am I doing wrong? <laughs> this is just an, exp you know, this is not all, this is fiction, it's just for the conversation. So why do you have to, you don't have to, you're not doing anything wrong. No, I'm like, not. Yeah. No, it feels uncomfortable because it's not about my vagina or vulva, it's about yours. But still, <laughs> to get to the question I think is hard without bringing in your own experience as a woman. So I'm just wondering, well, can you just tell us about how you become a fluffy marshmallow in space? Because I'm really curious. Like, 
How do you get there? Tell us about the journey if you don't want to share so the destination. So I share that journey yeah. in the TED Talk. I think it would be better to speak about what I spoke about tonight and see if other people have questions. Because that doesn't feel to me like the most helpful question or, or answer. But then, okay, but then I want to go back to one thing. Because then your transformational uh, design, oh, well, by the way, the, If you, if you, if I, uh, if you allow me, there's two microphones, and I'm really inviting you to ask questions. That's why they're there. You can just go walk to the microphones and ask them, so we can all hear you. But I just let me finish this one because this is my fascination. Like the transformation for you, yeah, as you describe it also in the YouTube videos, is the journey yeah. towards destination. Yeah. I understand what you're telling me with the metaphor about your mom and the Greek and Japanese mythology, yeah. but I'm finding it pretty hard to get a grip on what this journey means more practically. Like, what's in it that's so transformational and how do you get there? I'm just trying to understand what I'm looking at. Okay, so the description of becoming the marshmallow is poetry. It's a way to explain a feeling of euphoria in the body, which was the experience that I had of experiencing cervical orgasm. So, in a way, this sense of obliteration from self is something that we deeply crave as humans. It's something we feel in connection with another. It's something we feel in sex. It's something we feel when we're taking drugs. Like, there's something in us which wants to feel a, the dissolution of our ego for a moment and to connect into that. That is so what... It's Letting go of ego. Yeah. It's, the, it's an experience of total surrender. And that's what I'm describing when I talk about the cervical orgasm and the marshmallow. Yeah, but that's it. No, but now that, you know, like these words give, like it's letting go of ego. Yeah. And I can imagine that that yeah. must be a wonderful feeling. Yeah. yeah. I absolutely can. Please. Hi. Hi. <laughs> I'm a little bit disconnected, and I don't know if someone else is feeling that too, so I would like that we all would start asking questions Please and do. would make more like a us thing. Woo! And, uh, yeah, I came here because my friend told me today that you were coming, and I, am, I became a mother since two years, mm -hmm. and I was that pretty amazing person before, and since I became a mother, it's like, what the fuck? <laughs> you know? And it's like, life is so fucking boring right now. And, I mean, this is exciting for me, coming to this place and talking about the booba, you know? It's like, <sighs> I feel so much pain, really. And I so much can connect to what you're saying, you know, like, not the depression, but this state of, not knowing how to move forward and mm. knowing that something is wrong. Not wrong, but you, I cannot, I'm, I don't know, I'm stuck, you know? Mm. I'm, I'm, I'm stuck and I don't know, it, I feel I'm inspired to be here and somehow you gave me energy to, to keep on exploring myself. Mm. And that's it, I don't have a specific question. I just wanted to make it more connected to life. Mm. Thank you. <laughs> Reflect on that. Thank you. <laughs> Would you like a particular response from me, or did you just want to share that? I just wanted to share. Yeah. Thank you. It was very welcome. Is that something you recognize? Women uh, sharing the experience of somehow feeling disconnected to themselves after becoming, of giving birth and becoming a mom, life being taken over for a while, I guess. Is that something you hear often? Well, I aren't a mother myself. So interestingly, um, I haven't had that experience, but I definitely know that it's something that women experience because it completely changes our concept of reality. Um, 
and in a sense, there is, we lose a sense of our identity. And there seems to be a yearning at some point to re-know ourselves again after having gone through that. I think it's pretty brave that you share that because maybe there's a taboo on sharing that motherhood is not just, I don't know, happy, happy yo-yo. Um, how, how big is the problem of taboos in addressing what it is you're trying to address? Like, do, is there, it's 2019, so one would think we are beyond that. But still now our country is going uh, at least the social media about, I think it was a, uh, an artwork of a woman masturbating, of uh, menstruating, mm -hmm. so that's really ill. So uh, how much of the problems you hear are connected to social taboos still? Mm, well, I think there's definitely a lot of, um, there's a lot of mental blocks within people's minds. And and there is an element which it takes to connect into the body and an ability to be vulnerable and to meet another person and to hear, to have this conversation. And I think this lady beautifully demonstrated that. There's something about just being able to go inwards and feel. And I think when people can do that, it's pretty easy to connect with anyone. I, I have a belief that there's like this idea that British people are very kind of uptight and stiff. But when you speak to them on a one-on-one -on -one level, I find that people are really open. People are human. And, and, and people have a capacity to be vulnerable. Can you remember the moment, so you described this closet with uh, blue clothes, and I mm -hmm. don't remember the other color, but brown. the brown yeah. representing the you you didn't want to be. Yeah. If you talk about going from being disconnected to connected again, yeah. what was the uh, what what experience had the biggest impact on you? Well, I think the use of the clothes in the story for me, the the clothes represent something and they represent self-expression. Now, an individual self-expression doesn't have to be my version of self-expression or my mum's version of self-expression. A woman can wear black all the time and be fully expressed. It's about what they represented to me. And there was a lyric that I used to listen to as a child which said, you grow up and you calm down and you're working for the clamp down. You start wearing blue and brown and you're working for the clamp down. No man born with a living soul can be working for the clamp down. And so that was very strong for me, that image. Do you want me to finish your question? Yeah, or? no, yeah, if you, if you Hello, want to John. finish, but we have a, a woman. Hi. <laughs> Hi, Keely. I just wanted to ask, you mentioned the distinct, uh, you mentioned uh, about your mother yeah. living the pussy revolution. Yeah. You weren't sure if it was for herself or via you. Mm -hmm. um, I just wanted to ask you more about that distinction. Yeah. So, I guess what I mean by that is, what I meant was maybe she's not started masturbating for an hour a day, uh, five times a week, but there's something in her seeing me and the work that I do, which, is, which allows her to connect, for something to awaken within her. And it happens slowly. And it happens in a different way for different people. Like, some people are like, okay, I'm ready. Take me on the journey, let's go. I want multiple orgasms. And other people are like, <laughs> oh, like, oh, I can, I can start to hold my body in a different way. And it can be very different for different people. And so that's what I meant with her. It definitely feels that through our relationship and uh, through the pussy revolution, she's been able to connect to something within her that had been very arid for a long time. Does that answer your question? Yes. Uh, but in a way, it seemed like 
that you, it seemed that you were saying maybe that was a lesser thing or that that might not lead oh. to to where it should or where okay um yeah okay is that the case definitely not no i think i th like what is more beautiful than a person just making a small decision to be more happy within themselves so absolutely not to me the fact that I see her wearing the pink top is like, like the spring tulips, you know, it's mm -hmm. like so, like, oh, like it makes my heart explode. And there's no part of me which is like, okay, and now you need to do this, this, and this, and you need to get here. It's like whatever your journey is, whatever the pace, whatever the path, just to be on that and to make a small choice to move more towards yourself is very beautiful. We have another question, maybe? Yep. Uh, <laughs> I actually had two questions, but I think maybe the first is already answered, mm -hmm. but I'm still going to ask it. Uh, you, had, you were talking about orgasm, uh, that you're experiencing um, a dissolution of the ego. Yeah. But at the same time, in the beginning, you said that um, through orgasms, mm -hmm. you can um, like discover more mm -hmm. within yourself. Yeah. I, w I wanted to ask you about that. Like, yeah. How exactly is like I can I can see I think what you mean. Yeah. But how does orgasm explicitly yeah. do this? And the second question is, do you have the key to squirting? I'm really <laughs> wanna know. <laughs> okay. I really wanna know. Okay. <laughs> so so I'll answer the second question first. Okay. <laughs> and I do have a YouTube video on this, so oh, you can definitely it. watch that. <laughs> but the best way that I know how to describe it. And I found that I would ask people and they would tell me, but no one quite said it in this way, is that you stimulate the G-spot, whether or not it exists. Yeah. Um, <laughs> you, you stimulate like that area of the vagina. And then if you, when you feel like aroused, if you bear down and push, you can squirt. Push your belly? Or like push it's like... I'm so sorry for saying this, but it's a little bit like taking a shit out of your vagina. <laughs> like that kind of feeling. That's the only way I know how to describe it. Um, <laughs> that's how I was able to have that experience myself. I imagine for women who've had birth, it's like giving birth, that, that, kind of like that bearing down, pushing feeling. But to say bearing understands what I mean. Um, so I don't know, there might be other people in the audience who have a better way to describe that. Um, <laughs> Well, definitely check out the YouTube video. Okay. Okay. Yes, and then thanks. give it a go. Um, and and then so, the first question. And yeah. And so to answer the first question, which was how identity and orgasm are connected, yeah. right? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, um, just ask me again in your words. Well, um, I was just thinking because you said like orgasm is sort of a dissolving like this mm -hmm. dissolution yeah uh, of the ego for a moment at least yeah but then how would you say is, is, does orgasms yeah, okay. yeah like got it okay <laughs> so there is um okay so if a, if someone has courage they have balls right mm -hmm. and and we in kind of like in the wizard of oz there's this scarecrow who has no brain and the Tin man who has no heart and the lion who has no courage, meaning he's got no sexuality, he's got no virility. When we awaken the sexuality in the body, the, the, the kind of standard sexuality is we have sex here in, only in the genitals and we push it out through ejaculation, through like really short contracted orgasm. And if we use breath and sound, we can move the sexual energy through the body. And that kind of awakens the body. And so orgasm can become this like full body transcendental state. And what this does is like when this energy awakens in the body, it brings a sense of confidence and courage. And so we want the intelligence and the heart and the sex all open in the body. And this is what allows for the full self-expression. And so in that sense, it's like the sexual energy can really 
give us the ability and the confidence to be who we are in the world. And it is through that that we have the, the full personal expression. That, does that answer your question? Yeah. yeah. Okay, beautiful. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. We have another question. I'm happy that you're now joining. Hi, Keely. Hi, Margot. We, are, we started in the same year. Maybe that's uh, good to know. Mm -hmm. um, in my experience, uh, opening up my orgasm, it's a, um, it's a wonderful process when it works. And at the same time, it's one of the most intense and hellish processes I've gone through. Mm -hmm. Processing trauma, processing mm -hmm. so many kind of nasty, ugly, horrible experiences. What's, what's your experience with that? So... Now, can I, as an outsider, ask what study that is? Because you studied the same thing. Just for my, is this? I, I, I don't know how you. Uh, yeah. Oh, sorry. I yeah, thought we you did our sexuality training. Oh, yeah. the sexuality yeah. training. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry. Training. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. 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 I, I, it's for me. It was a lot about experience more, uh, both of the good stuff, but also more of the crappy stuff. Yeah. What's okay. your experience on that? So, I feel one of the reasons I spoke about the heroine's journey is because it, we have this life-death-rebirth cycle as women. And so, we have to die, we have to be able to feel the death within us, the devastating emotions, the grief, the sadness, the sorrow. And exactly what you're describing, our sexuality gives us the capacity to feel that. And I think as we can feel that, yeah, it's not just all about joy. People, people take the journey because they want the joy and they want the orgasm. But it is like a, a death in so many ways to the ego and it forces us to deal with all those painful experiences. So I think it's a really beautiful training in women learning how to care for themselves internally, of being able to nourish that soul life. And so... Was it your experience that being able to go through that darkness, you found new ways within yourself that you can hold yourself and become more of yourself? Is that a question? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, definitely. But um, it's also scary because yeah. I also start to express more of that to the outer world. Uh, so, yeah. for example, I uh, worked a lot on anger. Mm -hmm. I think a lot of women are holding back their anger or holding back their power to set boundaries. But to start expressing that in, I work in a corporate environment, that's scary as shit. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and it you is. mean expressing emotions yeah. like anger? You no, know, just show my colleagues I'm really fucking angry right now. And uh, a lot of tears were involved in that and a lot of drama, you know, at the office floor. Oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. So for me, that's the other side of, um, you know, and it, it helps me to open up to experience mm. more, more joy, more pleasure. And it's also really hard to bring that into the world, I think. Yeah. And how did colleagues respond to that? Amazing. At first? <laughs> <laughs> I've never received so much love and so much care from my colleagues, which is oh, really so interesting. So you got positive response to yeah. it. Okay. Definitely. Interesting. Well, that's the revolution. That, that's the courage, having the courage to be yourself. And to whether that is received or not, that is what's so pioneering. So, uh, woo! Go, Marga! <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but I think it's also important uh, to, to let them know it's not only yeah, about yeah. pleasure. Yeah, okay. Yeah. yeah. Side note, people. <laughs> it's not just about pleasure. Be ready to cry. <laughs> Um, I have a masturbation question. Yeah. Um, I love what you're saying about how masturbation and self-love are so important that if you can get in touch with yourself, it has these wonderful reverberations of power throughout the rest of your life. Mm -hmm. um, so from a practical perspective, when you're getting to know your own body and mm -hmm. finding what you like and you don't like, mm -hmm. and you're exploring like what society tells you, particularly as a woman, you should be aroused by versus what you're actually aroused by, mm -hmm. um, and doing all these things in a very private way in your masturbation practice, do you feel that there could be a role for porn? And I ask this because, um, total Jennifer disclosure, I'm an erotic filmmaker. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I thought you. I that knew you. I was expecting. <laughs> yeah, it's Thank Jennifer. You. I'm Thank I'm seeing guys. this correctly, right? It's Jennifer Lyon Bell yeah, I'm looking right. at. Thank yeah. You. Oh gosh. Yeah. She, yeah. 
Hi, Jennifer. Thank you. Hi. Nice to see you again, Yeah, it's been a long time. Yeah, it has been yeah, a long time. Yeah, she's a female porn producer. Well, yeah. female. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, whatever. Yeah, whatever. So call it whatever you want. Um, so, yeah, I mean, that actually is part of the question because, like, mm -hmm. you could answer this differently for porn or porn porn or whatever mm -hmm. you think that is um, versus alternative porn or feminist porn or maybe you think it's all the same, you know, if it's all, like, sexual representation of sexuality, but do you see a role for that in your personal <laughs> masturbation process? And um, and if so, how? And if not, why not? Because I understand that isn't for everybody. And in a similar question, do you also see a role for vibrators or does it need to not be about that? Okay, beautiful, thank you. So the reason you got a standing ovation from me is because I have to fly back to the UK tomorrow because I'm taking a night course in film so that I can direct feminist porn. Oh, great! <laughs> <laughs> so, so anyone who'd like to start in some. Um, so I totally think that feminist porn or indie-made porn, alternative porn, ethical porn, however you want to call it, is this phenomenal tool to really transform not, not even just to like turn people on in masturbation, but to change the, the way our minds think and see and perceive sexuality. So I yes. think that you, you're my icon. <laughs> <laughs> I can't wait to see what you're going to make. That sounds really good. Um, Great. So yes, the answer yeah. is yes. The then. answer is yes. Yes, 100%. <laughs> I, the, some of the first feminist porn that I watched, I cried. I didn't masturbate to it, I cried. Like it moved me so profoundly that this is actually what real female sexuality is. And I'd never ever seen that portrayed and it was so vulnerable and beautiful. Um, so was that the big difference, vulnerability? That yeah, it's, because it's you, just Because you real. so explicit, explicitly felt that. So what was the biggest thing that hit you com eh, comparing it to more mainstream porn? Uh, well, my idea of main, mainstream porn, I've watched a lot of mainstream porn, I talk about it in my book, and I learned to orgasm through doing that. It definitely played its role, but it, it's just about, as Erica Luss says, punish fucking women. It's not, it's not a real <coughs> sex. Um, and so to see actual real tenderness and beautiful expression of sexuality and to see sexuality from the female gaze, I think is really revolutionary and brilliant. And the second question was about... About vibrators? vibrators yeah. Is that okay? Yeah. 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 So I think anything's okay. I think what we want to pay attention to is if um, we use something as a crux, right? If we just... Um, the same way if, if we're eating. If we just keep eating food that's not really that good for us, we don't want to do that all the time. And I'm not saying that vibrators are not good for us, but if we use them all the time maybe there could be a way to say, okay, what if I ex try and explore this in a different way or find a new aspect? So I, I don't have any hard and fast rules of things being good or bad. I definitely have vibrators. I definitely use them sometimes. And I love to also not use them. And I do find I, in, I have a deeper, more profound experience not using them. Okay. Yeah. Great. Thank yeah. you yeah. so much. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. You're satisfied? Yes. <laughs> Please go ahead. Yeah, um, well, my question is about you talking about joyfulness and pleasure, and that really resonated with me because I think we're often stuck in problems, and, mm. and that's also very okay, of course, but my question was how can we be more joyful? Do you have more yeah. tips or practical yeah. stuff? Okay, yeah. I think it's a beautiful question, and you yeah. look very joyful. Well, thank to you. me, you inspire joy. <laughs> Thanks. So, thank yeah. you. Um, so some practical tips on how to create more yeah. joy. Yes. Because that's my goal for this year. Yeah, <laughs> okay. So yeah. the best way, I would say, is, is to, be, to be embodied. And so how you do that practically is you breathe into your body. And so... And you literally breathe into your body. You allow yourself to be in your body, to feel the sensations in your body. It's something we do when we dance, yeah. right? And so we, music can take us there. But we can, we can really tune into a sense of orgasm, of joy, of pleasure in our bodies any moment through breathing, through cultivating presence, through activating your senses, through really being aware of like, oh my God, like this is a hand. 
and how good it feels to touch yeah. this hand. Um, so. Yeah, that's a good start. <laughs> <laughs> I think also um, cultivating really deep, beautiful female relationships can be a, a profound sense of joy for women. Um, other women who can, can get you on that level of joy, of wanting to feel joy and experience joy, yeah. can be very, very transformative. Okay, thanks. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> um, the people on the balcony don't have a microphone, so I'm just checking, I can see you. Is there anyone who really wants to ask something? Because if you speak out loud, I will repeat the question, so people watching the live stream hear it, but I don't want to uh, skip you. So please, if you, if you can speak loud, yeah. I think we'll manage. So I wonder if in your practice you also have worked with trans women? Because a lot of discussion is about female sexuality, I find quite uh, problematic. Yeah. Um, and if that's something yeah. Yeah. If you see a place for trans women within yeah. this uh, the story you're sharing here tonight, right? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for that question. So, 100%, there is a space in sexuality for anyone and everyone, and I feel, for me personally, something that I'm actually am interested in is almost being able to have a conversation with trans women to understand what their experience is, to hear that voice, to know what that is. Because I aren't a trans woman, and so I, I don't have that embodied experience to fully know what that experience is. And I think it's something that is very beautiful and valid and needs to be brought into the conversation. So is there anything- Is that okay for you? You wanna say in response? You don't have experience in your practice, sorry, I'm repeating. No, not personally. Although I do have a colleague who uh, works, who has much more experience. Yeah, so if you want to email me and I can share those, uh, yeah, please do. <laughs> yeah. Before I see you, one second, because I think there was one other person at the balcony. Yes. yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, what are you, what are you, are your your opinions about that? Because sometimes I think it's 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 repressing women, and sometimes I think mm. oh, I just don't have the time. I, I just want to come. You know. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Okay. Can so, you repeat the question? So we. Yeah. So the, the question yeah. was um, about lube. Um, what's your name? What's your oh. name? The lady in <laughs> the lady in yellow. <laughs> it's okay. <laughs> We're not getting a name. She's in yellow. <laughs> Maya. 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 Okay. Beautiful. So Maya's question was uh, about lube. <laughs> Sometimes she feels like it can disempower women, uh, but sometimes she feels like she just doesn't have the time and she wants to, you know... Have a quick fuck. Have a quick fuck. Come. Come. Oh, sorry, sorry. A quick come. Yeah. <laughs> and use lube. Yeah, well... <laughs> yeah. yeah. Okay, so my response to that question is... Um, ...inventive, and we love to create solutions, and I think solutions are great, and so lube serves its purpose, and as I said before, with vibrators, I don't... I don't think there's a need to have hard rules on things. Like, lube can be beautiful and it can be disempowering and it can be anywhere in that spectrum. And so, feeling into, does this, does this feel like the most nourishing thing for me in this moment? And if the answer is yes, then moving in that direction. And sometimes the answer to come quick and use lube is, yes, this is the best thing for me in this moment. And other times it might not be. And so, I think that's a really... Um, useful way to determine, to connect into our truth in that moment. So you're saying there's no rule, it's about staying close to your own needs yeah. and, and it doesn't matter what those needs are. Just Yeah, yeah. and I think there's, um, you can also explore the world of lube. There will be some phenomenal lubes that really creative, innovative people have made with like <laughs> cannabis in and like all sorts of different things. So get creative, right? Go organic if you want to do that. Um, <laughs> go organic. <laughs> we go to the next question. <laughs> I, 
I just want to say one more thing. Oh on yeah, that. sorry. Yeah. Uh, one more thing which I found really useful is using oil. So I I actually find using oil, skin safe oil, on the vulva can really sensitize. It's like going for a massage, just skin on skin, or you use massage oil, and it creates a deep sensitivity. So using almond oil, coconut oil, I just use olive oil. <laughs> um, anything that's in the kitchen uh, can can actually be really nice and yeah so a different perspective there okay we go to the next question we first, have about 15 minutes left 20 first of all I can testify to the coconut oil it's really <laughs> always really nice uh, yeah my question is the opposite of cultivating joy but actually mm. releasing shame because yeah. for me in my life sex has always come until recently, but still with shame attached yeah. to it. And of course, I can tell my girlfriends, oh yeah, no shame, but what are some actual, like relevant, real ways mm -hmm. in the moment to really let go of the shame? Yeah, okay, beautiful question, thank you. So the first thing is to, when you feel it, just where do you feel it in the body? Just become aware to what you're feeling in the body, what sensations am I feeling? Just having an awareness. You can use things like sound to express the sensation that you're feeling. Allow it to be in the body. Allow yourself to experience the shame because it's the experience, experiencing of it which will allow it to transform and move. The other thing is to just really hold yourself in a sense of love. Okay, so the part of me which feels shame right now can I hold her with love? Can I mother this part of me? And really cultivating that is the, the most transformative thing, in, I think, in self-pleasure, is we learn how to hold inner parts of ourselves which are wounded. And when the part of you which feels shame knows that she can feel it. She's not going to be shamed or judged for feeling it. She can experience it. You can feel it in your body and you can breathe through it. Then it can become something else and you don't become afraid of feeling the shame anymore because you know it's going to pass and move. Does that answer your question? Yeah, but does it pass and move? Because okay. I feel like I've done a lot of experiencing but none of the like letting go thing. Okay. And that's where I'm ready to like... <laughs> so some tips on that. Okay. So that, tell, me, that part of it. tell me more about... You, your experience and how you experience it so far? Oh, God, okay. <laughs> no, I mean, for me, it goes... Am I in a safe place? Yeah, okay. Uh, like, starting for me, I lost my virginity to a really religious person, and it was mm -hmm. already from the beginning, sex is guilty. Sex mm -hmm. is guilty. We right away had to put our clothes back on. And for me, mm -hmm. that was my first experience. Mm -hmm. And from then, it's always kind of been this uphill battle. And... When I had had sex, it was always, I felt it in my entire body, like it had to be quick, it had to be, like any mess that I left was yeah. not nice, mm -hmm. it was shameful, and of course if you're on your period and there's blood or any kind of like body fluid, any smell, anything like this mm -hmm. is a shame, it's something you want to hide, so I feel that in my body, like mm -hmm. I really want to hide it, and where in my body, I feel it everywhere yeah. in my body, I don't want anyone to know, I want to be proper. And I felt it, and I'm so aware of it, and mm -hmm. I have a lot of my girlfriends who have this as well, and I'm always, mm -hmm. from an outside point of view, really quick to say, oh, yeah, but come on, it's just natural, or oh, it's, mm -hmm. it's fine. But for my own self, to really be able to accept that it's natural and then move on from that to be like, yeah, I left that blood. <laughs> That's I'm a woman, I'm powerful. <laughs> I, how do you move into that? Because for me, it's... Like we were talking that shame is such a learned behavior and I've learned mm. it really, really good and really deep. Yeah. So how do I unlearn this? How do I let yeah. it go? And yeah, okay. So, so what if you just put your hands onto your womb, onto your lower belly and do that right now and just close your eyes and just breathe there. And just breathe deeply into this part of your body. It's not the first time I've done this today. 
I'll tell you. <laughs> <laughs> Say that again? This is not the first time I've done this today. Yeah. Breathe into my abdomen. Uh -huh. <laughs> And how does it feel in that moment to do that, to, to be present, to be aware of the sensation of the hands on the body? It feels okay. Yeah? Yeah. But I'm like in a safe place full of women who, yeah. who know the shame that's been following us yeah. forever. So it's a practice. Yeah. It's something you cultivate over time. And you build the relationship to the body and you breathe in to the womb and you feel the energy of the womb. And you can do things like feel a red rose in your womb and expand through your body. Mm. It's things like this which start to... It's like the, the body is a living tissue. And the disconnection, because I used to feel this, um, of, like it's here. It's like I'm all in my head and I have all this feeling and I'm like terrified to go there. <laughs> you know, it's like... Because when I go there, it feels like... Mm. Which is probably shame, right? Yeah. Or something. And I remember the first time I did a, a meditation where I, um, I think I was like squeezing the muscles of different parts of the vagina and then I, I was like meditating in the womb and it felt like this desert and I felt so gross. It was like, this feels disgusting to me. And I didn't understand why, it just felt like that. And I spent so long being disconnected from this part of my body. Now... I do that, and I'm like, ah, flowers everywhere. <laughs> um, <laughs> and it's, it's because I built a relationship to that part of my body over time. I allowed it to become sensitized. I allowed it to feel how it felt in that moment. And so to answer the question, is you cultivate a practice over time of a loving connection to your vulva, to your pussy, to your vagina. And... It doesn't, it's not like the shame disappears in an instant, but you're, you're like building these two parallel tracks. So the shame can be there, or the disconnection, or the grossness, whatever it is for you, but then you also are building this sense of love, and sense of acceptance, and sense of beauty. And you do it long, and one starts to take over. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Thank Anything you. Else? Thank you. Thank you. Sorry we kept you waiting. No, no, no. I think <laughs> you, you've answered most of my questions uh, now. But I had a very specific question because we're talking all the time about this total surrender and out, mm. about opening up and that you can let in everything and get this full body orgasm. And um, um, I think last time... or like I also want to share something, what I experienced, which is maybe also um, nice for you to know, because, because I think two weeks ago or something, on a Friday night, I was a bit bored and I wanted to clean my house and then I ate a little magic mushroom. And after that I couldn't sleep, but it was just a little, little microdose. And I couldn't sleep and I thought, fuck, how do I go to sleep now because I really have to wake up early tomorrow morning and then I, yeah, there's one solution. So I start to think about, okay, um, I'm in my body now and I'm going totally into my body. I'm going to visualize everything what's in me and, and I had the most, the most amazing orgasm ever. Uh, so I can, <laughs> I, I, and Oh, there are more people who do this. And then the next day I thought, okay, I'm going to do this again. And, uh, but now without anything. And, it, and mm. trying to do these breathing exercises and mm. totally f um, feeling up. But still, there's a lot of stiffness then in your body. But how do you release that? Like those, mm. there's always a tension somewhere. Yeah. How do you deal with that? Yeah, okay. So... So we, with the breathing, you can also like do physical release. So if you feel a lot of tension in the pelvis, you can do practices like pelvic bouncing, like really like vigorously bouncing the pelvis mm. while breathing, feeling the, the energy stream through the body. You can release it through sound. So if you're feeling a lot of tension and stiffness, you can like kick the legs if you're feeling it there and like scream as you're doing mm. it. So it's like a, an embodied release of what you're feeling. Um, is, does that... I, does that yeah, I'm yeah, I was, yeah, just this last mm. tension, mainly yeah. in, for me, it's in my legs, like, that, yeah. yeah. 
of yeah. course you're going to do at some point, but you want to release because yeah, yeah. When do you when do you hold tight and when do you open up? Like, yeah. isn't well, this like part of the orgasm? Yeah, like, I'm, it's yeah. I don't understand that. Yeah. Okay. So sometimes <laughs> what can happen if if you're feeling the rigidity in the legs is the body. Um, so in biodynamic breath work, so you breathe, you're activating the body, and then you allow the, the natural expression of the body. And so the body often knows exactly what it wants to release. And so what can happen is if you feel the urge to move your legs, is in some level, on a sensational level, it's like a stress cycle being, re being released from the body. So if at some point in your life you, like, were in, in fear and you froze, and then that stays as a trauma pattern in the body. And so... The, and this is what Margot was talking about, how sexual awakening is actually like, like it will break you to your knees um, because you, it will bring up the tension, the stuckness in the body and you can release that through kicking and almost mm. it's like you're lying down and you can like make it like so your legs are running mm. um, and that can release the energy in the body and help to release that tension. Okay. Yeah. So I need to kick more. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'm now visualizing you with the mushroom kicking. Uh, I will do it on the yeah. bike next time. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Uh, and we have time for two last questions. And then I really invite you, if you have any questions left, I hope you will be having yeah, a drink yeah. here somewhere. So Keely is still around. But it's my job to look at the clock as well. Yeah. So are we is it with two? Am I covered? Or did we have three people? Then we do three. Okay. Okay. Yeah, yeah, of course. I just want to add, is it Denise? Are you Denise? Jill. Is it Jill. Jill. Okay. Um, just to add one more thing to that is um, when, we, when we do these kind of practices, it can be really intense. And so to have a level of like safety. In, in my book, I explain how to do the practices and in my YouTube videos, I have a lot. And then in my self-pleasure school, I te take women through practices in this like really held and safe way. So sexual awakening is a way that we can liberate the body and you also want to have an awareness that you, uh, you don't push yourself too far, if that makes sense. So if you start doing it and then it feels like you can't contain yourself, you want to just hold yourself in a space of love and safety while also allowing the energy and the intensity. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Three. Am I? Do I cover? A are four. you all satisfied with three people left? Four. <laughs> yeah, yeah, because I don't want to be impolite, but if we. You want me to hurry up? Yeah, well, no, no, no! Don't oh, hurry. That's <laughs> okay, that's but fine. But then I will try to okay. keep it short. Yeah. Uh, my question is regarding body positivity and sexuality. Yeah. Because you're talking about the connection. Uh, do you think you should have a positive attitude towards your own body? Of course, that that's necessary before you can get to that connection or that you can get a more positive attitude towards your own body throughout that sexuality. Yeah. What is the... Yeah, the okay. Way? I think um, it's the chicken and the egg. Yeah. It's the, it's the, it, I think both, totally both. It can happen in both and they're kind of like these two parallel paths and one will lead to the other. If you start down the path of sexuality and you start to see how disconnected you are from your body, kind of a little bit what I was talking about before, that can bring you to heal that relationship with the body and vice versa, you've got a beautiful relationship with the body and then it's like, okay, now I want to experience sexuality. So, yeah, I see them as being really two sides of the same coin. Okay, thank yeah? you. Does that yeah. answer your question? Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Thank you. Please go ahead. Yes, thank you very much for this uh, wonderful evening. My question is about what was uh, the was a trigger moment that you decide to uh, make your uh, experience public, like your sexuality mm -hmm. public. I'm I'm interested, and I would like to give just a little bit of context to that question. Like last weekend, there was an article in the Guardian about a book coming yeah. out, Womanhood, about women photographing uh, vulvas, mm -hmm. and it was um, on Twitter. There was. Uh, uh, a man who uh, said, actually, the correct word is vagina. And then uh, a <laughs> thousand comments followed and everything. And what it does, it, man, it, it diminishes a woman's agency. And I feel in my daily experience, everything is made to, to diminish, 
diminish that agency. And when you try to talk about your experience, whether you mentioned like earlier PTSD, women with PTSD or mm -hmm. other things, mm -hmm. there is no space. It's very hard to create this uh, mm -hmm. space. I'm trying also to teach that uh, in design, but it's, it's very difficult to come to the right word, to the right tools, to the right representation that is not um, uh, located into also pornography. So mm -hmm. what triggered that experience, yeah. that moment, what it did to you? Yeah, okay. Yeah. I just, um, I read an article about yeah. um, diseases one can get uh, uh, that's, that are all in the vulva area for opzij. And then I found out just to defend not particularly this man, but just a little bit, we have this TV show called Coffee Tide, and every year they have the week of the vagina, and they have clay, and then in the TV studio they clay a vagina, which is actually a hole, so you're claying a hole. Mm -hmm. That's what you're doing, the edit, because it's a vulva. So it's even a lot of women, I believe, who think it's called the vagina and not a vulva. I think there's a lot of well, misunderstanding I, I amongst women as well. <laughs> yeah, yeah well, and I, I find that fascinating, that even mm -hmm. women are not. Mm -hmm. So, sorry, sorry, mm -hmm. but I felt the yeah. need to help this man a little bit. Yeah, um, and so the, you, the question is specifically, given the context... When yeah, the, why uh, did you decide to go public, public about public? this? this yeah. Because it's a very powerful uh, yeah. decision, you know, that it changed your life, basically. So Yeah. Um, so it was, it was like an impulse within me that I couldn't get away from. It was so strong. Um, and it was because I'd had... The, the experience that I'd had in sexuality, and I had grown up with my mother and seen other women that I was friends with who was like, who all of our, you know, my first sexual experience was in a derelict house when I was about 14 with a friend and we were like, shall we just see each other's genitals? There was no romance in any of it. And I knew that this was the experience of all of my peers and I'd seen physical abuse in friends' mothers and sexual abuse and and the fear, right? I felt intense fear. I speak about the fear I feel in the TED talk because it was fucking terrifying. And it was, it, for me, it was so wrong, the general accepted view of sexuality, that that drove me to, to want to say, like, this is something different. We can think about this differently. And seeing my mother that day in London was a huge impact. And most of my best friends from university, at some point in their 20s or even 30s, have ended up in therapy or you know, had some sort of real deep struggle with themselves, with mental health. And I just thought, like, and the PTSD, it's like, what the fuck? Like, we just the fear is an illusion, like it isn't even real. Like everyone in this room, perhaps, I mean, I can't speak for other people, but can tell that there's something deeper about sexuality. It's why we're all here. There's something that is misrepresented and it was really that drive to have that conversation. Thank you. Thank yeah. you. Okay. Next. Hi, uh, you talked about cervic Orgasm. Yeah. I've never heard of it before. Yeah. So could you give me some tips? Is yeah. that something I could do with masturbation or yeah. yeah, how yeah, okay. Could you tell me more? Yes, I can. <laughs> it's actually my most watched YouTube video. How to have your first deep vaginal or cervical orgasm. So um, the cervix is at the, the the deep end of the vagina. So if you take a dildo, glass dildo, and put it in the vagina until it doesn't go any further, it's touching the cervix. And basically, you c the cervix can be quite tender in a woman if she's not really experienced pleasure there before. And so there's a process called dearmoring, which one can do, which is it's kind of like, like massage release for the vagina and for the cervix. And so I talk about this in detail in the video. But basically, you want to take a glass dildo and you massage the inside of your vagina up to the cervix. You massage the cervix, you release, you're using breath, you're sounding the pain of the cervix or the tenderness or the sensation. And maybe you don't feel pain, maybe you just feel pleasure or maybe a bit of numbness or nothingness. That's all normal. And so you want to awaken the internal vagina and release. And then you'll start to feel pleasure there. And so what you can then do is 
usually the kind of sensation that stimulates the cervix is like deep, slow, repetitive, like 40, 50 minute stimulation of the cervix. So nothing about our kind of like mainstream form of acceptive sex, okay? And you can start to awaken the pleasure there by stimulating the clitoris and breathing that pleasure through the vagina. And it's a, it's a meditation, right? You're kind of like breathing into the sensation and awakening that pleasure. And it, it can take months to awaken the cervix, but it's a worthwhile journey to go on, okay? <laughs> Thank so you. you also always has, have to use a dildo or... Uh, well, um, you could try with your fingers, but a lot of women can't reach the cervix with the fingers. So that's why you would use uh, a dildo. But if you can, you can totally use your fingers. Okay. Um, it, but also it can be a little bit of a difficult body posture to be in <laughs> for so long, that kind of thing. So, yeah. Yeah. Great, thank you. All right, <laughs> thanks. <laughs> the last question. Hi. Um, well, uh, how do I, um, I had a good youth, uh, and my, yeah, <laughs> I, know, I just want to say, I, uh, my mom uh, and uh, father taught me about sex, and yeah. they were loving about sex. They said, no, sex is loving, blah, blah, blah. Uh, but still, I was ashamed mm -hmm. about my own vagina and also about sex, and it took me a long time for to become more confident about it, and still learning. Um, now I have a boyfriend who has two beautiful girls, uh, mm -hmm. 10 years old, and they mm -hmm. become 11. Mm -hmm. And um, last a uh, few months ago, they told me that they were. They said yes. When I touch it, it feels very good. And I said yes, it's good. Every don't be ashamed. Everyone does it. The queen, your father, <laughs> me. You know, just to become like don't be ashamed. And they were like yeah, yeah, yeah. W what can what can I do to become, I mean, my parents, they never told me to be ashamed. Uh, is it something that is uh, inherent? Uh, um, Culturally so, or? Yeah, is it something that is part of the, the women's journey, what you say, mm. that, you, that you first become ashamed, that you have to do this to, become, to come here to, mm -hmm. you know, to get your, at your 30s? Mm -hmm. I want them to be confident in their 10, in their teen years, become, yeah. what can we do? Yeah. We. So. Woo! <laughs> <laughs> well, first of all, I'll say that this woman here in the red is the pioneer of bringing up sexually empowered daughters. Um, so <laughs> uh, maybe Laura can have something to add, but I would say the, the first thing is the way that you inhabit your own body. So just your presence and the way that you speak to them is going to be so powerful and, and really model for them because we learn a lot of how we are as women through the, or even through we are in our bodies, through the people that surround us. So what you're doing is absolutely brilliant. <laughs> um, and, and yes, we can't control no. the, the external experience or what, what they may experience in different... We can't ever stop them. We can't protect them from having experiences which may at some point cause them shame. Um, but really speaking to them and allowing that, and then whenever it feels appropriate to you at a certain age, you can talk to them in detail about it and explain to them, like, openly like what what do you enjoy and how like how it can be for them like tell them about it really give them that i think that is what's missing from the culture that's why i have a self-pleasure school so that women can learn this is part of who they are and part of their lives yeah, yeah. so talk about the cervic <laughs> orgasm yeah and yeah. and if you feel comfortable you can show them your yeah. vagina right and tell yeah. them different parts and there's a website called OMG Yes. Yeah, oh my I God, know. yes. Yeah. Things like that. Like you can. Yeah. Be as open as you feel comfortable to being. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Kili, one last question uh, from me. What is your expectation? Like. 50, 60 years ago, it was women burning bras. It was maybe some of our mothers traveling the country, showing their vulvas on stages. You know, this is a vulva, take a closer look. And, 
And here we are, 50, 60 years later, again mm -hmm. uh, addressing the taboos, the shame I heard. Mm -hmm. What's your expectation? Like, are you the last wave? Or mm -hmm. will there be, I don't know, Keeleys for another 50 years? Well, what's your. Yeah. Oh, I'm sure there'll continue to be more waves of human evolution. But my desire for 50, 60 years' time would be that the way that people relate to their sexuality, the way that they relate to their bodies, the way that they engage in relationship is completely transformed. It's open and it's available. If you think about the way that food industry has changed, you know, 40, 50 years ago, we thought that the digestive system was mechanical and that was it. And now we know that it really influences every aspect of our life. And I think the same for sex. It will become this deep integrated part of human relationships and families and culture. So you're optimistic. I'm optimistic, yeah. Well. Oh. Look at all these beautiful <laughs> people. <laughs> um, thank you all, also the people at the balcony, very much for coming here tonight. I hope uh, your disconnection was restored enough. And if that was, if it was me, I apologize. But it's, I had to connect with something, you know, I, like not all women are the same. And I really liked getting children and wearing jogging and feeling mm -hmm. Totally fine looking like a dipshit. <laughs> that was liberation for me. And, you know, getting children and uh, life being about something much bigger than me really freed me so much. So I really did my very best mm -hmm. to connect with all of you. But I am, I'm afraid, from another planet sometimes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But I did learn a lot and I appreciate it very much. And I think you do too, that so many people were so open here tonight. That's uh, pure bravery. So I comment you on that. Mm -hmm. I thank you for being here, being honest. I, I hope you enjoyed and invite all of you well, I think maybe there's some questions left. I hope Keely will be in the building and mm -hmm. there's wine. So please go and enjoy. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.